Namaskar. Welcome to P Guru's Prime Time. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I have the pleasure of company of Sri Sridhar Chityala Ji. Sridhar Ji, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar and good morning to everybody. Viewers, today we are going to talk about the rise of Bitcoin. Is digital currency for real? What does it mean when someone says say, that today one Bitcoin is worth about fifty-six thousand dollars? What gives it this valuation? To, to understand all these things, today we will be having a discussion. I'm going to be playing the antagonist and uh, Sridharji will be perhaps playing the protagonist. Between the two of us, we will give you the reality here. So to start off, let's take a look at how we look at currency today. For example, I have in my hand a uh, 10 rupee note. I hope you can see it. Sir, can you see it, sir? Yeah. Okay. So this is 10 rupees. And I just read it here, Reserve Bank of India guaranteed by the central government. And it is signed by the governor, the then governor of uh, Republic, Rep um, uh, Reserve Bank of India, Urjit Patel. And now I have here a $1 bill of United States. Cleaners, can we see it, sir? Can you see it, sir? Sure. Yeah. So we also call it a Washington because $1 bill has uh, the picture of Washington on it. And here, the United States of government says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. It used to be much more direct. It used to say, I promise to pay the bearer of this so much. That used to be the text. Nowadays, people have kind of refined it. I don't know if this is better than what it used to be. It had a personal touch before. Regardless, what I'm trying to say is, this money, the money that a government prints out is guaranteed by that government that saying that this is I guarantee you that is the asset is being guaranteed by the government saying that I stand behind this currency. Now you take a look at Bitcoin. What is the asset that is there behind it? Nothing. And yet people are so enamored of it that now it is just having an amazing run. And as we will progress into this, you will start seeing some, uh, you know, data and slides where you will see how quickly the evaluation of Bitcoin has reached one trillion. So to, to understand a little bit more in context, something that has no asset, it's a series of numbers and its charm seems to be that there are only 20, 21, 23 million Bitcoins out there, already three quarters are mined. Therefore, this limited resource, uh, it has a value. Just like somebody is trying to equate very crudely gold with Bitcoin, because gold also, the resource is limited in the world, but gold never fades. Pure gold stays pure. It doesn't rust. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't matter what natural elements you put it in. Maybe you can melt it in sulfuric acid. I don't know. But my point here is, is somebody equating Bitcoin with gold and saying, therefore, that the value needs to be so high. To understand all these things, to answer all these questions and doubts of mine, I'm going to now defer to Sridharji. Sridharji, this is my initial argument. In my opinion, this is just a series of numbers. What do you say? What do you say, sir? Well, I think that, uh, you know, it's a great context. Uh, um, and uh, sorry, I mentioned good morning. Good morning to U.S. viewers and good evening to you, those who are in uh, in India and uh, wherever you are in the world, the appropriate uh, uh, the salutations. And happy Mother's Day to all on this day, at least in United States, Australia, in some parts of the world, we celebrate Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all. Uh, now to set the, uh, to respond to the, uh, to the specific question which is being raised um uh, you know is it a commodity or is it a currency okay the question that boils down to is it is it a commodity or is it a currency the way the uh, bit currency uh, the bit uh, the, the cryptocurrencies have evolved is it is accepted as a form of payment its origin is it's accepted as it is evolved as a, as as a form of payment um whereas gold is uh, a commodity which is priced like a copper, etc. So that's number one. Uh, number two is uh, to say that there's nothing behind uh, is probably uh, too harsh. Uh, you cannot go and get a Bitcoin uh, with nothing. You have to put $50,000 of liquid currency, whether it's euro, whether it's US dollar, doesn't matter. You have to put a fiat currency to acquire one unit of Bitcoin. So therefore, 
it is cash based but it is not cash backed um it's not asset backed but it is currency based so there is no you cannot go and give gold and say give me five bitcoins you have to put liquid even if you have stock like tesla they liquidated their stock converted that into 1.5 billion dollars of cash and went and bought dodge coin or whatever they went and bought so therefore it is cash based so why this question comes up in terms of uh is bitcoin um you know uh, is real what is it etc first and foremost is it is accepted or it is being accepted by people of you know either individuals or businesses which say you know i accept uh bitcoin as a method of transacting so as long as you have this bitcoin whether it is bitcoin or whether it is dodge coin or whether it is luber or whether it is uh, ethereum it doesn't matter but they say and there begins the first basis of commerce so they accept why the governments have not intervened the volumes are very still very negligible and insignificant so the governments have stated no i won't kind of uh, intervene let's see what happens here so this is the origins and evolution of uh, this crypto which in my view is a currency but it's not regulated and it's not yet accepted by the central banks because they are not they are the only issuers of any form of currency thank you sir for that introductory uh, um, uh, starter now viewers we are taking questions please send your questions in connection with digital currency you can also add questions based on the technology on which digital currency is based which is blockchain technology it's also called as digital ledger technology um, the way i look at it blockchain is a subset of digital ledger technology and and so anything around this we will definitely try and answer your question so now to get back to the basics of what is a bitcoin a bitcoin is something that is a series of numbers and you have to go through a series of processes to come up with a new bitcoin and that new bitcoin is accepted by a group of people who say yes you have mined because you have gone through a lot of processing you have mined all this and this group which consists of i think 50 or 100 individuals who are completely independent they will do some verification on what you claim as a new bitcoin and then tell you yes you have a new bitcoin and we accept you so that is how somebody who spends perhaps $20000 today in computing resources running servers and processes over a period of days to come up with a bitcoin and then lays claim for that so you put in 20000 30000 40000 to get back one bitcoin which is $50000 worth this is the process of manufacturing or mining it's called bitcoin now what we know for sure is that china has these server farms where people are mining this 24 by 7 huge swaths of computers that are running this thing again and again it's not just china you have them in north korea you have them in iran you have them in many other eastern bloc countries perhaps a few in the united states also so people have to because three quarters of the bitcoin bitcoins are already mined people have to continuously process more and more and more and more and to get less and less and less and less so this is just as far as bitcoin is concerned what about the other types of digital currency one currency that i like because i worked with it is ethereum because ethereum is also a a, a digital currency except it has built a ecosystem an ecosystem around it called ethereum wallet and the ethereum wallet has built in power it has built in features to support somebody think of it like i'm carrying a wallet and i'm traveling to three different countries i need to use the us dollar the euro and the british pound let's just say uh, an ethereum wallet allows you to carry all these things easily in a wallet which is actually on your comp- uh, on your smartphone so you can use this this smartphone and be able to navigate back and forth you can even do conversion where somebody says i only will take actual pounds so you can go and do that so this is my premise i do see a lot of advantages of the technology but in terms of 
uh, the currency Bitcoin, what prevents XYZ from coming up with another one, call it as uh, ZIT, ZIT coin, and say that I have 100 million of these that you can mine. And, and completely, you know, uh, dilute Bitcoin's value because there is no asset behind it. What are your thoughts, sir? <clears throat> I think my thoughts, uh, the way I would respond to that question uh, is everything has what we call as scale, depth, and scope. Um, and the scale, depth, and scope uh, evolves from, as you rightly pointed out, Bit uh, these cryptocurrencies have an ecosystem. An ecosystem that comprises of uh, minting, mining, which is these tokens, tokens that they issue, right? They are the forms of, okay, a redeemable unit of value. And if you have a un unique number, then you have a unique store of value that is kind of assigned to it. So, and then you have uh, a distribution mechanism to basically distribute. Uh, I'm sorry, just give me 30 seconds, please. Yeah. So, while... Uh uh, Sridharji is addressing his phone call. Um, we are taking questions for this Hangout as long as they are around the Bitcoin technology or digital currency. Please continue, sir. So I think that the, uh, 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 so there is the ecosystem where you can uh, obtain value, you can exchange for goods or services, and then you can redeem that value uh, when you cash it, when you want to cash it back into your base currency, which is your US dollar or euro, with which you funded it, the larger the ecosystem, the larger the uh, the power of that specific currency. The reason why Bitcoin today is one trillion versus an Ethereum, which is a four fifty two billion dollars uh, in market cap, is purely because Bitcoin came early. It got initial adoption before it tapered. Uh, but it now seems to have gained uh, momentum around that. And um, so therefore, unless you have an ecosystem of both uh, uh, holders and uh, people with whom you can exchange value, you're not going to see the development of a well-defined cryptocurrency as, it, as, 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 as a form of payment. There are over 8,000 players in the market today over 92 to 94 percent of them are fraudulent. Only five to six percent of them are have intrinsic kind of value. So there are three important parameters. First and foremost, is it does it is it reaching a critical mass of threshold of coins in circulation? Number two, what is the total AUM of that holding? It's number two. Number three, are there players who recognize this? If you recall going back, you know, uh, almost to 2018, 2017, Amazon was one of the first players who said, you can use Bitcoin to buy stuff in my retail store. So you need a critical, you need a mechanism by which you can exchange this, uh, exchange this value. Once you develop that, you begin to see automatically, uh, the, it, just like the currency market, the value begins to go up. So that is the basis behind uh, the the valuation and the evolution of the currencies in the marketplace. And um, now you you alluded to the valuation of two companies, um, Ethernet, uh, Ether, Ethereum and Bitcoin. Now, um, there is also an ecosystem that is developing around the DLT or the digital ledger technology. Uh, by the way, AUM, if I understand correctly, it's assets under management. All right. Right? Yeah. So, so we, we have this fundamental technology called blockchain and the blockchain, in my opinion, is going to play a very important role in our lives because in a post-pandemic world, we have to learn to be able to take this trust. That is, when you do a, a transaction with, say, Amazon, there is a certain protocol that happens and there is a communication called as SSL, Secure Sockets Layer which makes sure that only you and Amazon can see the text in clear and nobody else in the middle can see what is the transaction. That is how you securely, especially when you have a lock on the website when you are doing the transaction, that is how you establish this thing. Now, what is going to happen is this might not be enough. For example, your son can use your, uh, your computer to uh, buy things. 
Now you want to be able to prevent that, especially if your son's exam is being taken by you. So, so the question I'm trying to say is, blockchain has the advantage of being able to uniquely identify people to take this identification to a much higher level. So the technology itself is good. Sir, what do you think made Elon Musk? Because I see this recent craze for going up. One of the fundamental things is that Elon Musk said, I will take Bitcoins for Tesla car. You see, great technology, Tesla, of course, I think of it as a computer on wheels, a very good computer, on a very stable set of wheels, very quiet, but, and so when a, when a, when a guy who's got a, you know, tech savvy person says that I will accept Bitcoins for my Tesla, that kind of, you know, kindles somebody's imagination and say, huh, this guy, I can just take a Bitcoin, which is a piece of paper, give it to him. He's going to take this paper and he's going to probably do, you know, uh, you know, notify and then put it away and give you here, take the car and go. It's got a certain romantic ring to it. Sir, what made you, what do you think made Elon Musk say that he will accept Bitcoins for uh, Teslas? Well, I think that, uh, so let's also add Mark Cuban to that list. These are yes. the two boys yes. in, uh, in, in this specific uh, point game. I think what, what he's saying is that, um, look, maybe I'm going to create a global B2B e-commerce ecosystem whereby, okay, the fundamental premise behind the evolution of cryptocurrency and this concept of distributed ledger, which is the which is the blockchain as the underlying piece of technology, as uh, Sriji pointed out, is efficiency of exchanging payment at the lowest cost. When you use your Visa, when you use your MasterCard, when you use your PayPal, you have a fee that is attached at every transaction kind of a level. Whereas here, you know, for me to exchange to buy on a transaction level, you don't, you have a, almost an insignificant fee. So the whole premise behind this is around the efficiency of conducting trade and commerce. So what motivates, and I think we discussed this in one of the DGI shows, hey, with just one coin, I can buy, I can give you a Tesla car. You know, with two coins, if you hold two Bitcoins, I'll be able to give you a Tesla car. By the way, if you have three Ethereum coins, I'll be able to give you. Oh, I want to support Dogecoin. He was live yesterday on uh, Saturday Night Live, and you know it was hilarious. Uh, you could see the moment of you know this is less than uh, what you call. I think you know it's, less, it's about seventy-three cents or seventy cents or something. The price kind of toggling as he was giving this session. So he's saying I'm in a Dogecoin. So Dogecoin went up. So what he is basically espousing is that I am a large value, low transaction player. So do I use dollars or do I use an alternate currency which gives me that efficiency in, some, in terms of managing payments and receiving real time value of the, the store of value that I must receive for unloading my cards. That's the premise with which this gentleman launched and he proved, he made his point by saying, I now have $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. And when the market shot up, he added 400 or $500 million of profit to his, recognized it in his, in his last quarter earnings by selling it. That doesn't mean he's quit the market. He is leveraging the market gains and market opportunities along with other stuff that he innovatively does to demonstrate to the market. So this is the premise, which is namely why this is coming. By the way, this is not just, uh, 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 you know, uh, what's his name, Elon Musk. There's governments experimenting with this, which is to say, I'm a Chinese issued yuan denominated thing. So if you want to be dealing with me to buy my goods and commodities, then you need to only trade with me in digital. So you completely by bypass the world monetary system and create your own currency model by which you can transact. So are we going down that path? There's a lot of experiments going on, including banks have experimented with this in terms of trading and settling securities to mitigate systemic risk. So this is the premise. And I think the genesis of Elon Musk model is nothing but a manifestation and scaling up of this effort to say, 
Is there a mechanism? And how do I infuse confidence in people to buy this and trade with me? Thank you, sir. And um, viewers, uh, I just want to add to what uh, Sridhar ji said that perhaps it also imperils, you know, this wire transfer fee when you transfer money across boundaries from one country to another, there's a hefty wire transfer fee that banks charge. That perhaps also is under risk. And most importantly, sir, read me this doubt. Would this ring the death knell for Havalas? Uh, look, I think that uh, this is one of the principal reasons why regulators are concerned is that this is an unregulated market. It's a distributed ledger. So there is a considerable amount of anonymity in the transactional execution. There is no concept of a KYC process here. In fact, Havala market may flourish using this Bitcoin in a legitimate manner until the regulators type kind of come in. That's why there's a regulatory resistance, notwithstanding the fact regulators themselves are trying to do trials and tests on this, especially some of the guys who are raising noise in the market. Very good, sir. Thank you. And, and now let us take a look at a quick slideshow, a series of pictures that uh, Sridharji and I have put together for your comprehension on how this is getting wider and wider adoption. And with each uh, slide, Sridharji will have a few words to add. Sir, with your permission, can I start the slideshow now? Yes, I think you just have to tell me which slide because uh, I'm not live on the television. So that way I can uh, follow the, I, I can, uh, yeah. No, no worries, sir. So we, we are now going to the uh, first slide. Fastest to reach 1 trillion market cap. You know, market capitalization crudely is the number of outstanding shares multiplied by the last price at which the shares sold, I think. You can correct me wrong about what market cap means, sir. Uh, so Bitcoin has reached that number in 12 years. It took Microsoft 44 years, Apple 42 years. Sir, this is incredible. From you should just look at numbers. What are your thoughts? Do you think it is going to stay there? Where do you think it's going to be going? So when I mean, we first and foremost, one trillion market cap is uncharted territory until recently. You know, Chevron, which was between five hundred to seven hundred billion dollars market cap, now you can see is around two thirty to forty, uh, you know, billion dollars market cap. Um, uh, you, you guys can go and check the numbers later. I'm just giving you the rough trend line. So trillion dollars corporations are, are phenomenal in that specific you know, context. So the fact that the Bitcoin today, the total market is 2.3 trillion and it has reached the 1 trillion in 12 years is a reflection that there is some element of substance behind it notwithstanding the fact there is considerable resistance around it. Everybody can touch and feel an Amazon, everybody can touch and feel an Apple, everybody can touch and feel a Microsoft. Can everybody touch and feel Google? No. No, you can't touch and feel Google. All you can see is this whole Google ecosystem is built on advertising revenue. So the question that one has to ask is, is advertising on Google going to disappear? Is advertising on digital ecosystem going to disappear? If that's the case, obviously the market cap of Google is going to dramatically come down because its earning is dependent on the prime earning. The prime driver of earning is dependent on Google. So what is driving Bitcoin? There's an underlying belief that this is coming mainstream. That is why you have volume, as you said, 18 to 21 million uh, coins that is issued. It is a transactional medium. There seems to be at least a developing B2B ecosystem. If it was a B2C ecosystem, I very much doubt this valuation would have skyrocketed the way it has. Actually, valuation dipped. If you go back to the 2017-18 numbers, it came down to 3,000 in 2018. Everybody was kind of, you know, and there was also fraud uh, in Japan in one of the uh, mining companies. And now it has <coughs> kind of reorchestrated itself and you saw the climb going up. So to me, I think that this is a, this is a, 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 a bell that is ringing, which is to say we are coming mainstream folks. And viewers, if you happen to be living in the United States, for sure I can tell you this, 
Um, owning Bitcoin, you have to give a several set of declarations when you file your taxes. The window is still there, six or seven more days left before you can file your taxes. And then there could be an AMT tax for owning Bitcoin because the government IRS may say, oh wait, you bought it at 3,000, it's at 50,000, there is an unrecognized gain here. I don't know, you need to check with your auditor, accountant to understand how this is. It's a little bit tricky, a little bit procedural if you're going to file taxes. Sir, with your permission, can I go to the next slide? Because then we'll be, we'll be able to look at uh, what is happening to the overall market in terms of prices going up. For example, since March 30th, 2020, lumber is up 400%. Bitcoin is up over 722%. Dogecoin is up over 5,579% and national debt, debt, that is of the United States, is nearing 30 trillion. Now, well, the, yeah, go sorry. ahead, sir, go ahead. You, no, 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 I'll wait. So, so my point here is everything points to a galloping inflation that is coming just around the corner. Um, so, so we would, should, People place money in Bitcoin because then they can hold that value or write that thing. What are your thoughts, sir? It's a little sophisticated, little complica complicated answer here, but let me try to uh, uh, state uh, in simple terms. As the debt goes, the currencies get devalued. Um, the fact that the U.S. debt is 30 trillion and, and to this year we may be adding six trillion dollars. This year being current year 2021. So US dollar, US dollar denominated assets could be depreciated and the currency itself could be uh, devalued, not that it cares being a reserve currency. So what you're witnessing, the trigger of some of these big players, Cuban and uh, you know Elon Musk and so on saying, huh, this is stable. It is, it seems to have some tailwind because there are players behind it and therefore if it becomes a tradable commodity which it is today because there are many exchanges where you actually can trade and you can redeem and if it also becomes a commerce vehicle then I'm far better to have a small percentage of my allocation in alternate asset which is crypto back rather than pure liquid US dollar as a currency. So this is the premise behind the um, those numbers that uh, Shriji put out. Thank you, sir. Um, before I go to the next slide, uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, perhaps you, you've already answered it, but I just want to kind of go back to many of us who learned economics for at least one or two semesters, even engineers learn economics. Money is a matter of functions for a medium, a measure, a standard, a store. Yeah. Does Bitcoin satisfy all these, sir? Is it a medium? The answer is yes. Is it a store? The answer is yes. Is it tradable? The answer is yes. Is it a fiat currency? Not yet. Okay, sir, thank you very much. Uh, viewers, I hope that explains to at least help you set a context on where Bitcoin is headed. So the next slide I'm going up. Now, banks and big boys are joining the fray. Visa is playing with it, MasterCard, PayPal, and so on and so forth. What do you see these people doing? I, of course, their lunch is going to be eaten if everybody switches to Bitcoin for transactions. How do you think they will kind of blend this thing into their existing transactional model? Many of these are payment instruments, uh, Visa, PayPal, MasterCard, they're payment instruments in, in, its, in the first place. So the answer to the question is, they're saying, if you have a Visa card, by the way, you can use your Visa card to fund buying of cryptocurrency. Then is it treated if you are in the cards business? Then they ask the question, what's the merchant code? Is it treated? If I take $100 from my Visa card, is it treated as cash advance? So therefore I have surcharge and uh, you know interest charges incurred by me, or is it given a merchant code like what they call 
MOTO, money order, telephone order, which has a 10% interchange rate? Or is it treated like Walmart, where you pay only 93 cents or 90 cents or 65 cents, as the case may be? This is the fee that the merchant pays Visa and MasterCard, which in turn goes to the bank. So the story is these PayPal and Visa and MasterCard are negotiating with these different exchanges and different um, currency issuers, which is namely cryptocurrency issuers. Hey, you know, please accept me because then you'll get critical mass, but therefore, uh, you know, charge me only this interchange rate. So it's a convenient mechanism for people to use it. That's the role this Visa, PayPal, MasterCard, and all those people are playing. No, no, they are also coming up with a network. So you can have Euro, you can have US dollar, you can have Indian rupee, you can have any of those things. They'll be able to take money from your debit card or your, uh, your, your funding account and, and, and pay uh, the merchant and you will then get your uh, digital Bitcoin assigned. So therefore, as issuers of uh, what you call payment, electronic payment mechanisms, uh, in, in denominated kind of currency, currency of value, uh, they want to be uh, players because this is a network payment model, both for acquiring as well as transacting. Sir, we go on to the next uh, slide. Now, the big boys are also moving in. Goldman Sachs has launched a fund focused on crypto. Now, when, when somebody says a fund, what comes to my mind, sir, is, is it an index fund? or is it uh, you know a fund of a particular sector uh, is how do you see this fund and where do you think the benefits for this fund lie at the moment the uh, details are pretty sketchy in terms of what goldman is offering but let me uh, um, um, so there's one mechanism whereby um, you know they give a, they give an allocation of holdings of 6 or 7 different currencies, they come up with a unit price by blending these different currencies and say, if you want to acquire one unit of the digital currency, uh, one unit of my crypto fund, this is the unit value. And its NAV or net asset value increases and its unit price goes on changing linked to the market prices, right? So they feed into the market prices. The relative percentage weightage determines um, how the unit price is determined on a daily basis. So I think that's the type of fund. There's also trading, um, you know, some derivatives instruments that are, that are building behind it. And you can also, add, you know, buy into that fund, which does this derivative tradings on some of these currencies. Um, and then the market price, get, uh, the unit prices gets appropriately allocated, goes up in the market. This is only for people, I think, who have $1 million of assets invested, liquid assets invested, in Goldman Sachs, only to them, uh, this is offered because of the high risk involved. Big boys game. <laughs> now, one interesting thing that has happened is a CEO of one of the largest hedge fund has quit his job and has joined a Bitcoin geek. So this sort of tells you that there is some confidence in Wall Street that this is here to stay, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Digby has joined NYD. NYD is now the latest gig in town. I think it is John Ridger's fund. Um, and they are planning to offer uh, uh, what you call uh, with fidelity uh, as the technology platform. So you have to have purse management, purse issuance, keeping stores of value, uh, distribution to various banks. Uh, you know, so they are uh, trying to come up with an ecosystem. And he has joined the fact that he has joined NYDIG is, is a big uh, is a big news in the market, which is also a recogn recogn uh, which is also a driver, sentimental driver. I think apart from all this, uh, the good news is that that the big players are getting into the market to try and give some substance behind it, uh, rather than a loosey goosey stuff in the market. And sir, now I have a slide that shows the correlation between the two popular digital currencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it started at 0.85 on the 1st of January last year. And now it is a little bit lower. It's around 0.75. Perhaps you would care to comment about this correlation. Uh, one to one means that Ethereum, my understanding, Ethereum is just as valuable as Bitcoin. And therefore, whatever rise you see in Bitcoin, you'll also see in 
Ethereum and you can make some money off of the arbitrage. What are your thoughts, sir? My thoughts are that the Bitcoin is slipping away uh, in terms of uh, both volume and value. You remember I mentioned the word AUM. Yes, the asset market, under management. Asset yeah. under management, yeah. Um, if, I, if you can give me uh, 30 seconds, one minute, let me kind of uh, please, please. Uh, pull up that value. Okay, so Bitcoin today, the market cap is about uh, 1 trillion. Um, if you take Ethereum, the market cap is about 452 uh, billion. If you take the unit price of Bitcoin, it's around 58,000. If you take the Ethereum's uh, unit, price is around 3,800 or four, less, less than $4,000. If you actually take a look at the volume, the volume of activity which is uh, trading in the market, um, you know, Bitcoin is 67 billion and the volume of Ethereum is around $54 billion in terms of trading in the market. So you are now beginning to see, notwithstanding the fact Ethereum started uh, almost on parity, Bitcoin is pulled away, but it's not too far in the back in terms of where Ethereum needs to be in terms of volume and valuation. Not necessarily, it doesn't have to be just unit price. The unit price can eventually um, accelerate as, uh, as has happened in the Bitcoin case. But this is the correlation uh, that you are seeing and that chart depicts that correlation. Okay, with that, our uh, initial talk about this uh, concept and this technology comes to an end. Sridharji, this was one of the most technically uh, brilliant conversations I've had. I know I pushed you a little bit here and there, and I think you also, you know, came back on your own. We had a very nice intellectual jousting session here. And uh, I, I'm not going to say that I'm now convinced and I'm going to jump into Bitcoin. I just can't afford it, but that's a different matter. <laughs> yeah. So let, let's start taking some questions, sir. Charan Sai wants to know, would Bitcoin fail to spur MSME growth if credit creation theory is true? I'm asking with respect to many of Richard Werner's talks. Uh, I think the... Um this is an ecosystem, I say we defined it, it's a high value, low transaction payment. Um, and clearly that the, as far as the MSME system, is, uh, MSME ecosystem is concerned, as long as they are within, let's say, electronic vehicle, electronic batteries, electronic uh, charging stations, uh, or they are in uh, the appropriate semiconductor fab manufacturing ecosystem. You see, these are the initial, the market trends indicate, these are the initial users of uh, the, the Bitcoin or the crypto, um, uh, crypto as a trading, uh, trading currency or a trading ecosystem. So if MSMEs are, uh, are, are intrinsically kind of part of it, then you may begin to see some spurt. As far as the credit is concerned, uh, the specific question as it relates to credit is concerned. Um, I am not sure we are convinced as yet um, that uh, they, you will see a direct linear correlation uh, to the, the spurt in credit in the MSME market. Nitin wants to know, sir, what about PI, PI, cryptocurrency? Is it trustworthy? There is an app of PI cryptocurrency. So I'm not going to comment which is credible, which is not credible. I'm just not going to because the reason is there's not enough data to basically validate in this program. That's a separate kind of a discussion. In this program, we're not going to be able to validate, okay, you know, let's go and do, go and buy a lot of Luber versus Pi, etc. So at this stage, my answer would be very difficult for us to opine and comment on that. Anish Lodha wants to know, why would any government allow crypto like no one in a centralized system would like a decentralized currency form? Uh, this will evolve as a closed loop ecosystem. It will not evolve as an open commerce payments model. This will only evolve as uh, a closed loop in the foreseeable future. We'll see what happens uh, as time goes on. Kapil Srivatsa wants to know, the total number of Bitcoins that ever will be mined is constant, 
but since the Bitcoin can be broken to any small quantity, is it not an unlimited source? Uh, it, it can become an unlimited source once there is enough depth in the market, once it is probably little more accepted as a regulated um, activity, regulated activity. Um, once um, in United States, I don't, uh, in the United States, there has been a number of attempts made to form a ETF. Um, and uh, the Securities Exchange Commission has repeatedly spurred. As of now, it is not yet an ex ATF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. So the story is it is not yet accepted as an ETF. So there are still some hurdles um, along its way for it to be unlimited wide supply of the, of the, of the tokens to be minted and available in the market. Vishant Nayak wants to know, if China backs or mines Bitcoin, can it replace the US dollar as world reserve currency? It can, re it can replace the currency with which it trades to all trading partners by a Bitcoin. It's, it will say, I will only supply you if you are investing in a Chinese, if you are trading and paying me back in Chinese denominated Bitcoin. Again, in one of the DGI programs, we have shared this concept of these exchanges, regional exchanges coming up, Japan starting an exchange, Korea starting an exchange, and China starting an exchange, and China coming to Japan, Japanese and Korean saying, we should not start separate, we should have a regional exchange whereby the government to government um, uh, trades can be conducted using the using the denominated kinds. So therefore, I think that there is very much a possibility for China to pull itself away and basically say that you will be only trading with me if you are settling me in my crypto. Um, we have done a fair amount of uh, talking on uh, daily global insights about this and I've also talked uh, about uh, what happens in terms of finance. Uh, that China used to be one side of every Bitcoin transaction for a long time. I'm not sure if it's still true or not, uh, because that tells you that one country is very, very firmly behind it. I think in one of the DGIs, uh, Sridharji mentioned that there's a consortium evolving between Japan, China, and I think South Korea, if I remember correctly. Right. So now what it means, if you take a look at the 198 countries, let's take a step back and look at the 198 countries, who are the holdouts? United States, India. India also announced that they are also looking, they are going to go into a digital currency. What prompted India to do that? The fact that China announced they were going to do what is called as a digital renminbi. And they didn't stop there. What China also said was that their digital RMB is going to be backed by gold assets. I haven't looked at the details, but here is a country which is trying to provide an asset behind its currency because basically China is trying left, right and center to dislodge US as the standard. Your thoughts, sir? Um, I think I the last, last point that you made, which is it doesn't want to be dictated by a currency that it is not part of because today China is, um, you know, is the second largest economy by 2030 or earlier, in fact, some analysts predict by 2028, China will bypass United States as the single largest economy, as the largest economy in the world. On PPP, it's already, lar you know, it's larger than United States. So therefore it says, United States, you cannot dictate to me that, uh, you know, um, that what currency I should be trading with Iran. Why all these trading restrictions kind of come in, which is effectively to state is basically that uh, banking system does not allow you to transact if you want to trade with Iran. Then it says, you know, I'll trade with Iran as long as you give it to me in renminbi. You take your dollars or euro, buy renminbi, keep it in your bank account in renminbi. I trade with you. No, don't worry about United Nations. So now they're trying to replace that. With, uh, with a digital currency ecosystem. Remember, today's exchange of value, we talked about the four economic parameters, 
The governments can overnight change it on certain categories of G to G transactions. Government to government transactions, they can come up with a new economic framework listing those four things that you alluded to, but may not be stretching that to retail, which is to say you have the store of value, which I recognize, the world may not recognize, you can kind of trade with me. So it becomes a limited purpose ecosystem um, activity, but yet they are small in transactions, but very significant in value. They also limit any kind of systemic turbulences that it causes when money moves from a banking system to a banking system, right? Which is to say, this is barred. So therefore, then you don't have that, what you call uh, circuit breakers between two countries which wants to trade. So China is very well, very much moving towards uh, an agnostic uh, e-commerce framework where it sets its own parameters with its counterparties or trading partners as to how it wants to do business. Pranay Roy Chaudhary wants to know, can crypto be treated as stocks in terms of behavior if one is to view crypto as an investment more so than a possible ecosystem? Yes, you are investing in um, as an equity type of uh, uh, trade today when you buy and sell. Um, it has a value. Um, it is traded in those exchanges. Um, and you can actually buy and sell. Uh, if you are a holder, you can sell it to another counterparty who is interested. You don't need to redeem a store of value. So to me, it is it is uh, uh, it is today very much traded as a market script. Now, there are two uh, other adjacent points that I would like to give here. One is there's a number of lessons that the crypto ecosystem has learned from the 2008-2009 crisis. In the 2008-2009 crisis, when mortgages, when different mortgages were packed into one single unit of value and retailed to a bunch of investors, they said this is going to go because there is a risk-weighted and risk-priced asset in this. So there is a linear coefficient in terms of the appreciation in value. So a lot of people bought. Nobody can could determine what the underlying market value is at given any given point of time because they couldn't take the individual script that is within it and they never listed it in the market so price discovery became very difficult whereas today when you take a look at the crypto there are exchanges where you can redeem value there are exchanges where you are where you see listed prices so lots of mistakes that happen in a soft uh, script which is the uh, whether you want to call it collateralized debt obligations or uh, mortgage-backed, very complex mortgage-backed securities, you find that in the Bitcoin tokens, there is a mechanism by which they have determined, there is a method by which the price is assigned. So this is very much going down like an equity or uh, a currency um, type, type of a script um, that you can trade, buy and trade in the market. That's how you need to look at. And in terms of, you don't all need to invest uh, if, you want, if you have money and you want to have a risk allocation, you know, this is what Elon Musk is saying. This is what others are saying as well. Have a small portion and begin to play around with it, whether it's 1%, 2%, 3%, 5% uh, of your holdings, uh, you can you can take it. This is not a 90% allocation model. And viewers, uh, what uh, Sridharji was referring to, collateral debt obligations and other fanciful derivatives were the ones that caused the 2008 crisis because the underlying asset uh, it was, uh, you know, it was self-inflicting in terms of when you go back and look at why they all started failing all at the same time. Now, we also know that Goldman Sachs is getting into the business of creating and building derivatives around Bitcoin. <laughs> Watch out. I think <laughs> Goldman Sachs is one of those people who will say bet on both sides. They'll be selling to somebody. And they'll be also insuring the same thing with uh, AIG. That's just my observation. Next question, sir. Gudapurva wants to know why India always lag in latest technology. Why not adopt crypto so that people can leapfrog to a new technology? I have an answer also. Please continue, sir. No, so you should give the answer uh, to this first, uh, Sriji. Okay, Guda. You know, you and I know that politics in India has become a resort of scoundrels. Okay, so when somebody decent, 
somebody honest, somebody who means well for the country, stands for election as an MLA, member of a legislative assembly, how do we treat them? They don't win. I have at least three or four cases, genuine candidates. If you don't have good people representing you, then how do you think the decision-making body, the law-making body is going to have the intellectual gravitas to decide what technology should India be adopting? That is where India's problem is. Sridharji and I can give you a lot of solutions. Unfortunately, India likes to follow, it doesn't like to lead. This is my two cents. Sir, you can dis uh, disagree with me or agree with me. No, I think that uh, I I, uh, I tend to I tend to agree with you, um, and I would like to point out um, to the technology ecosystem in India. The evolution of the technology ecosystem in India from ninety five or ninety four um, to about two thousand ten two thousand twelve, to a great extent, I was part of not part of as the tech, but as a user of that ecosystem. That happened because there was no governmental intervention. It is between banks and companies in United States, you know, talking to Infosys, uh, you know, Wipro, Tata Consulting Services, you know, HCL, uh, you know, Emphasis, uh, Cognizant, these companies and saying, hey, you know, can we work out a m method by which we, we uh, use your resources from a technology point of view and you become my extended kind of service provider. The whole legal framework to pricing, to the, uh, the solutioning that occurred happened outside the governmental ecosystem. If it had been, you have to get permissions to do each of these things that it wouldn't have taken off. Today, it's a you know, 300, 400 billion dollars industry, between 250 to 300 billion dollars industry evolved in less than two decades, wouldn't have happened. So to me, there is some analogy. Whenever there's a government involved in India, uh, for that matter, to some extent, to a great extent in any part of the world, you exception of China, with the exception of China, uh, you find that uh, you know everything uh, is self-defeating rather than self-fulfilling. Uh, that's the answer that I can give. Uh, you know, there's always an inherent fear. The other thing is also, I think Indian regulators and Indian central banks still use Bank of England as their basis for making any form of decisions. They cannot get out of this spindle. And that's another problem because Bank of England is still some distance behind in terms of the thought process around this. Thank you, sir. That was an enlightening answer. Viewers, we cannot take any more questions. We still have a few more questions to go through. And we are already 55 minutes or so into the program. The next question, sir. Neeraj Bajpai wants to know, can one reverse payment made in Bitcoin? Can one reverse a payment in Bitcoin? That is between a consumer to business? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 I think that uh, you between a consumer to business, you can. Kapil Srivatsa wants to know, will the Bitcoin price keep rising till the last Bitcoin is mined? And then what happens? Uh, there is always an augmentation of supply. It is not a static position, which is to say, I wish you we have run out. That's it. It's the end of the story, end of the world. Um, there is no such uh, framework as, as definitive as the case is. And they have always augmented it. If not, Bitcoin version 2 will come. Dodge 2 will come. So next fellow will come up and he will occupy that space. Uh, Mahesh wants to know, as regulators make their own crypto between their close group, like one for NATO, one for Euro, one for BRICS, etc., where is the need for these existing cryptos? Well, you know, I think that the market feels that it has uh, the, the market players and the entrepreneurs feel they have a role. So therefore, they believe they are the winner when they start. And if you listen to, if you have uh, been exposed to many of the pitch decks which these guys will present, they all look absolutely fabulous in terms of why this coin is going to take off like a sky, you know, skyrocket. And uh, a skyrocket. And uh, so the, po the point here is that entrepreneurs are here to play, in my view, 
this will become in the next five to 10 years, not in the next 12 to 24 months, you will find this ecosystem will shake out. And there may be about 10 players or 15 players in the market. You're not going to have 8,000 players in the market. Shivam Mishra wants to know, what's the long-term implications of using Bitcoin slash cryptocurrency for our nation? The advantage is, the advantage of that is, um, you will be in a position to uh, work with the trading partners and probably even negotiate a better pricing. Suppose you are a trading partner is China and China says you are going to pay me in Bitcoin. Then you are going to pay, you are going to get X amount of discount. That's one point. Number two is, is obviously it's also a considerable amount of stability around the, uh, the, 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 the the exchange rate fluctuations as number two. Number three is that um, it is still a very efficient risk-free model if two governments agree that there is the trading currency. This is, I mean, people would have seen, you can buy this big, you know, S400 and pay me in ruble. You don't need to pay me in US dollars. So that means India has enough ruble in its reserve bank. And they're saying, don't pay me in dollars because the reason is you may have exchange rate variations. You can pay me in ruble. So you will find that uh, this, uh, the inherent benefits come in once the governments agree to trade and once there is enough volume of trading activity between the two countries and then you can keep this as a store of value uh, for trading only for that specific purpose. And that brings us to a close on today's session on Bitcoins and digital currency. Viewers, I want your opinion, your thoughts on how you found this conversation because this is something that is worthy of a members only kind of a discussion because not everybody is going to be interested in digital currency or Bitcoin and the amount of time it takes to prepare something like this is quite significant. So please do send in your comments to us and we would love to try and interact back with you. And also, if you have not subscribed yet, please do subscribe. Please also consider becoming a member because your membership fees is what drives us to at least, uh, you know, cover some of the costs that we incur in putting together a program of this nature. Sridhar ji, from the bottom of my bottom of my heart, thank you very much, sir. You took days to put this thing together. We have been over this. We discussed the format, and I think the result is there for all to see. It was a fabulous, fantastic session. I. I'm myself saying this because I learned a lot more being, despite being a fintech man myself, I understand the technology, but the application, the world, the way it sees it, the way the world uses it, all those things, you opened my eyes to it. And I'm sure our viewers also benefited from this. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, sir. And we'll be back tomorrow at Daily Global Insights, as always, with Sridhar Ji. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you very much. Again, have a wonderful day and have a wonderful weekend.